of you who haven't followed uh, what happened with Manny Marable, with the biography of Malcolm X, let me just give you a one minute summary recap, right? As they see on TV, like previously on, give you that one minute recap, right? Before you watch the show, let me give you a one minute recap, all right? Previously on Black Scholarship, right? The autobiography of Malcolm X for the last 50 years has been the number one source on Malcolm X, right? This began to be replaced in 1992 when Spike Lee came out with his movie, Malcolm X. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but this is a private gathering, so I want to, I want to just ask a question. How many people here read the autobiography of Malcolm X? Raise your hand. Be honest. Okay, that's fantastic. That's more than, than I would get at Morgan State, where I taught alongside Dr. Ball. How many of you have seen the Malcolm X movie, the Spike Lee movie? Normally what happens is we get about five people out of 25 who've read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and we get almost the entire amount with the movie. Now, talking about the movie is a whole other topic. We're not going to talk about that. But I'm just talk, telling you about how this dialogue went in terms of Malcolm X's viewpoints and what viewpoints of Malcolm X gets put out, right? So the autobiography is the main book, then it's the movie, then Manning Marable, a major black scholar, decides he's going to do a biography on Malcolm X. Now, it was originally going to be a political biography, uh, but then the people who are in charge of book publishing, and there's only about, what, three companies now, right? Well, the, the, well I think they say officially there's six major global publishers. Right. But still, right. a handful. So one of these six came to Manning Marable with, I've heard a six-figure check, i heard a seven-figure check. When they come with this kind of check, you're supposed to do a full biography. Now, what the publisher is interested in uh, is details that will sell a book. There are many books that don't even get printed because the people involved don't want to dish dirt on the subject, right? But when they come with this check, implicit in that is that you want to dish some dirt. So Manny Marable does this full biography of Malcolm X, where he makes some very controversial assertions. Uh, Malcolm's parents were involved in murder. Um, what's, what's another search? You said that he cheated on Betty. That he cheated on Betty. That Betty cheated on him, his mm -hmm. wife, Betty Shabazz. Uh The most explosive one was, was that Malcolm was involved in some homosexual activity, right? And that became, by the way, the news item, because, you know, the news media mm -hmm. went and took the most sensational thing, as <laughs> news media does. And so they, that's, that's what, you know, you look up, you look up about, this, about the Manny Marable book, you'll see, in terms of major media, Malcolm X is gay, right? Mm -hmm. Now, regardless of whoever's gender orientation is, whatever that is, you've got to document these things. And we found, when we got the book, that... Manny Marable did a very bad job of documenting this. Now, Manny Marable is a major black scholar. And what made the situation even crazier was that he died the weekend before the book came out. So here you have this book out by now this martyr of black studies who you now can't challenge, who you now can't question. So the book comes out. Many of us see the holes in the book. Some people want to be polite. But Dr. Ball, who is one of the major activists of our generation, and that's just the truth, is more about the truth than about being polite. So a former Black Panther, Paul Coates, who has a publishing company, Black Classic Press, this is, a, this is one of the two major black book publishing countries in the country, came to Dr. Ball, not anybody else. They could have chose anybody in the country. They came to Dr. Ball and said, will you produce an anthology critiquing this Manning Marable book? And as Dr. Ball was wanting to do, he drags me into these kind of things, where I come in kicking and screaming, and then I get excited about whatever we're going to do. So we went and produced this book with a group of scholars who are mostly our age. Now, Keep in mind, we're in our mid to late 40s. For people like Manny Marable, we are still youth. 
Okay? So you guys get called youth by us, well, we're still be getting called youth by them, right? So we come out with this book, and we get ignored, we get this, I'll let Dr. Ball tell, tell that whole story. But let me just give you my critique of what Manny Marable did with this book called Malcolm X, A Lie of Reinvention. Uh, a Life of Reinvention. I'm sorry, Steve. Right, right, right. Slipping it up, <laughs> We call our book A Lie of Reinvention, right? We, we mess with Manny Marable's title. I'm a biographer, a wannabe biographer, I'm a historian, and I know that there are just four rules of how to produce a biography. One, you over-research. Two, you go where the subject went. Three, you interview everybody. And four, you separate your views from your subject's views. I found that Manny Marable did not do any of these four in producing this Malcolm X book. And when we talk about that, you know, we'll give you some details about that. And so that was my critique. Now, we have other people in this book. Uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, you may have heard of him, political prisoner. Uh, Kali Apuno, uh, Raymond Winbush. We have somebody who worked with Malcolm X, A. Peter Bailey, who was the editor of Malcolm X's newsletter. And so we compiled a group of people, too. Sorry? Rosemary. And Rosemary Mealy, thank you who also work with Malcolm X. So we, we compiled a group of people to go through Manny Marable's work and critique it. And like I said, we call our book a lie of reinvention. And we, we've caught hell for it ever since. And we're happy to do so. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say right now. I'm going to let Dr. Ball talk, and then we'll, then we'll open up. That was good. Thank you. I was trying to make it short. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I, I want to echo the sentiments of my colleague here in, in, in appreciating the invitation um, and you all for coming out, you know, given the weather, given all that else that is going on in the world. You know, we, we appreciate you coming out. Um, and as was said, we do take this topic very seriously. Uh, um, what I want to do, I just want to take a few minutes to, uh, yeah, so, in, well, to that to that point that we take it seriously, so we're happy uh, to, to, to speak with any size, group, anytime, anywhere, um, because not only was Malcolm X so important, but the ideas that he worked with and represent are so important. And for me, that was really uh, uh, my biggest concern with the Marable book, and I'll come back to that in a quick second. Um, yeah, there's a lot that we could that, that, that could be said, and, and perhaps during Q and A, we can talk a little bit about the process by which this book was put together. Uh, and as Dr. Burroughs said, I did want to grab him for help with this book because not only as uh, Paul Coates and I had discussed, but as as uh, I think a number of us think was important, the goal wasn't to you know we we didn't want this to be an individual project of any kind. We wanted to, it to be a collective response, and as one of our contributors. Uh, Patricia, Patricia Reed Merritt points it out, or puts it, the uh, black radical collective consciousness uh, had been assaulted by Manny Marable's book, so it needed a collective response, and that's what we wanted it to be. Um, and for all the praise he heaped on me, Dr. Burroughs is, is unfortunately too quietly one of, if not the leading expert of our generation, not only on many aspects of black history, but specifically the black press and its relationship uh, to, to political struggle in history. So, um, uh, and being a good friend of mine, I couldn't have imagined doing something like this without him. And plus, there was a, a weight to it. You know, we do take Malcolm seriously. We didn't, I didn't want to be um, at all in any way solely responsible for any sort of uh, uh, collection of responses without some, some serious help. Because what we think we wanted to, what we wanted to do was what we think Marable and his crew did not do enough of, which is to have a collective <coughs> a contribution to not only what the book what went into the book, but to how well it was put together um, and how well it was was uh, um, uh, vetted for its accuracy. Um, so as we can talk about, when Dr. Burroughs mentions that a lot of the, the response to Marable's book was around this assertion that uh, Malcolm X was gay. This was not the first time that this has occurred uh, in, in, in so-called scholarship. Um, but as, as I forget actually which one of our contributors pointed out, it may be Greg Thomas, it may be Ray Winbush, it may be both of them or, or several others. It's not only that, and I'm just using this as an example, it's not only that, that there was a claim that Malcolm was gay, but there was a claim based on 
uh, hearsay based on uh, speculation without evidence, and where on page 66, at the beginning of Maribel's book, there's this, there's this conversation about whether or not uh, Malcolm's retelling of someone else's story, in other words, saying that uh, he heard from someone else, someone put powder on some other man in some sort of pro process of, of uh, 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 youthful prostitution for, for white men. Um, by the end of the book, Malcolm is just listed as a homosexual, again, with no evidence. So the issue for me with using this as an example was that Marable had put together massive claims about Malcolm, including this one, without any real evidence in a book that was claiming to become be the new definitive product on Malcolm. And by definitive, we mean that it will be taught for the rest of your lives, the rest right. of your children's lives, that this will be the book on Malcolm X. And they said very specifically that they wanted this book to be what replaced the autobiography as that definitive text. That this was Marable and Viking Press's goal to produce something. Because part of what Marable does in his book, and we can again talk about this more if you all would like, is that he, he attacks the accuracy of the autobiography while replacing, so, so, in, 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 so just sort of in theory replace it with his own as the, again the go-to book. So now when universities or other uh, uh, institutions or anyone else wants to go find the book on Malcolm, they'll go to Marables even above and beyond Malcolm's own autobiography, which does have flaws in it which we talk about. Um, uh, but instead of isolating and identifying the flaws in the book and showing how his is an improvement, they just say, they just sort of say it without proving it, without demonstrating it. And as anyone can think about with anything, you hear something, whether it's on a street corner or at the store or wherever in the, in the family discussion, you want to be, you want to, particularly if it's, if it's incendiary, if it's a big time claim, you want someone to verify the source. And we all have people in the family like, well, you know, Uncle Jimmy's not the real source for that kind of information. <laughs> Maybe we need to check, you know, with, with someone else in the family to make sure that what Uncle Jimmy is saying is true. Well, Marable didn't even do this on the level of journalism or scholarship or something as big as this with the major support of an institution, of an Ivy League institution, with a research staff, etc., that most scholars uh, honestly don't get. Now, for me, the real issue is, is, is just this, and I, and I just want to use the rest of my few minutes to, to uh, initially here to talk about it from this way. That there is, <clears throat> with everything, there is a, a need to brand something. Um, and in this case, whether it's selling shoes or t-shirts or universities, uh, or in this case, uh, revolutionary scholars or revolutionary activists, um, there's a need to brand it in a certain way so that the brand carries on uh, its own function. So in other words, when you see the Nike swoosh on a shoe or a shirt, that, that symbol is meant to take you away psychologically from the process that went into creating the shoe, to, to, to take you away from any logical question about is the shoe or shirt actually better than another shoe or shirt, to take you away from logically thinking about the cost of the shoe or the shirt. All of those things, the brand is supposed to wipe away your ability to think logically so that you just, we all just want to go for the brand. Well, the same thing happens with scholarship, the same thing happens with, with, with figures such as Malcolm X and what they represent. So what, the, what Marable's book ends up doing is becoming, as I and others have argued, an attack on your generation and those coming up behind you. And the point I'm making here is that there has always been a goal, in fact stated explicitly uh, in the counterintelligence program and under the FBI, that there is a goal here to make sure that black youth coming up after the 60s and 70s do not associate themselves with radical politics. So there has been a long effort to rebrand radicalism and radical figures, including Malcolm X, so that by the time they come down to my generation and certainly to yours, there is, there is a version of them that doesn't inspire us to do the same thing. Right. And, and if I could just say, Marable taught at Columbia University, an Ivy League institution. So this idea that Dr. Ball is talking about starts from the top and gets into the uh, system, as it were, of black studies. So then black studies begins to be redefined. And how do the powers that be make sure that it's redefined? You give the Marable book the Pulitzer Prize, the top award you can win in American letters for history. Now, who gives out the Pulitzer Prizes? <laughs> Columbia University. <laughs> See? So you reinforce this idea that, okay, now we're going in another direction. We're going to take black studies and go in another direction. So you started that from the top, 
and then people get their cues from the middle, and, and then so, things get redefined. So what ends up happening is that um, Viking Press, the publisher, works with Marable, and, and I think over time, uh, since we published the book, even more was done by Viking Press and its lead editor, Wendy Wolf, than, than Marable himself, in creating a product, a brand, using, turning to, uh, using the Malcolm X brand to sell a new product. And this new product is not really, again, as brands do, meant to give you who Malcolm X really was, but to give you a version of Malcolm X that will take you away logically from what he represented into some new space. So to do that, they, create, they want to create a bestseller so they can make all this money uh, 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 and pay out all these sums of, 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 of you know, funds and, and advances, whatever, to Marable and his staff, uh, and then mostly to the editors and the, and the publishing house itself. But so that to do that, they have to make a product that is, is, is accessible to an audience that makes books best-selling books, which is white, mainstream, middle-class, or affluent uh, uh, readers. So to get that audience to buy a book about Malcolm X, you have to create a version of Malcolm that never really existed, because the one that really existed is Wendy Wolf, the publisher, the head editor of, of, for the publishing house, Viking Press said in her own uh, uh, words in a presentation she gave, the real Malcolm X scared her. So in other words, so in, 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 to, in order to create a product that is not scary to her own audience, you have to do a number of things, and then I'll wrap it up here, which is primarily you have to um, attack the idea of nationalism and what nationalism means. You have to attack the idea, all the other ideas that Malcolm was working with and associated, which, which would include nationalism, pan-Africanism, socialism, armed struggle, radical electoral political movements, that is, using black votes to collectively vote not for the reigning Democratic Party uh, appointee, but actual other, uh, well, as he said in his own words, uh, uh, people from the community who would represent the community to the best of their ability, as opposed to top-down, handed-down politicians sponsored by Wall Street who are promoted heavily that we then go and vote for. That was not what Malcolm was saying. Um, so all of these ideas have to be attacked, and they are attacked. And we, you know, I'll stop here in a moment. We can talk all about it. But those ideas are attacked through this 600-page book that Marable produced um, yeah. consistently. So he, the attacks on Garvey and the Garvey movement, the attacks on uh, Kwame Nkrumah and what he represented in terms of pan-Africanism and socialism, uh, attacks on the ideas of armed struggle, a complete rewriting, and, and I and others have identified where, where Marable literally truncates, that is, cuts off pieces of Malcolm's statements and refashions them, uh, fashions them to support a point about the use of the vote and other things that are completely antithetical or in opposition to what Malcolm was actually saying. Um, all of this to produce a document that in the post-Obama era would be something that would, would position, and this was really, and I'll stop here, where I primarily found the flaws in this, this, this presentation, that would position Barack Obama as the logical conclusion of what Malcolm X represented. To say that, that this moment that we have now with Barack Obama is the moment that Malcolm and others like him uh, uh, presaged or prefaced. And we had a major writer. Uh, yeah who happened to be the son of our publisher, write that. Right. That was interesting, too. Right? And, and... So, so, so yeah, let me just wrap this up here. That, 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 um, and let me just say, by the way, there's much more to get into. There's much more that we have. Uh, and if you ever take the time or would like to take the time, obviously we invite you to read our book. But uh, you can go to imixwhatilike.org and for free spend as much time as you like getting the, all the text and audio and video uh, when we talk more about uh, um, uh, this book and this work and its importance and its meaning. Um, and, but, uh, but I'll stop there uh, and let you offer up questions or comments, critiques or anything, and then we can uh, have a better, more, more Ask the most basic questions. We know we've given you a lot to Yeah, we said a lot. Deal with. Know, so yeah. if you want to ask the most basic question about Malcolm X, do so, because we want you to know about Malcolm X. That's the purpose of this tonight.